Hello, and welcome to our show for the love of animals. We're so glad you've joined us today. I'm Darlene Pickford. And our little friend Wicked here is asleep as usual. <laughs> I'm Greg Bauer, and I want to tell our viewers about a couple of upcoming shows okay. to stay tuned for. One, uh, we're going to do a second show on going fishing. Oh, great. Uh, we're going to look at paddle fish and bowfin. I think our viewers will find that very interesting. Very interesting. And also one on grooming your cat. Oh, boy, do we need that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes, but Darlene, what's on tap for today? Well, Greg, we're going to be buzzing along today uh -oh. with part two uh, <laughs> of Buzz from the Hive. Please introduce our guest. I'll be happy to. To Darlene's left is uh, Kent Williams, uh, who is a one of uh, two, well, actually, two he's three. the only active master beekeeper in the <laughs> state of Kentucky. And so he's a very, has a very special amount of knowledge, which we're going to hear from today. And, and to Kent's uh, right is Annie Broyles. You may remember her from part one of Bee of Buzz from the Hive. So we're happy that both of you have joined us and uh, these are experienced beekeepers, both of them, and uh, I think you're going to learn a lot more today. Uh, and if you need to, go back to that first part. Oh yeah, go back yeah. And, and see Buzz okay. from the Hive One. We're so glad that both of you ha uh, joined us. Annie, how did you get into the bee business? My husband wished for bees <laughs> and I went back to school after he, the, day or two after he had wished for bees and there was a swarm by my classroom door. Oh! <laughs> and that was our first hive and then a week or two later somebody called and says there's a hive in my backyard and the swarm's moved in, do you want it? And we went and got that. Oh. And from there it snowballed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and how long ha have you been uh, a raising a beekeeper? Since 1994 I believe. Oh, wow, mm -hmm. so that that's 20 years. 20 years. Wow, yeah. great. And Kent, how did you get into the bee business? Uh, my wife and I were growing produce and we had two acres of yellow squash which required an insect pollinator. Uh -huh. So we got a couple of hives of bees from a friend of mine that I knew that had bees. Uh -huh. And I bought, uh, I'd actually traded tobacco barn space for the first hive that we got. Uh -huh. okay. and. Uh, we got it for the purpose of pollination and almost immediately when people found out we had bees and we had honey, <laughs> we found out that honey was a product that sold itself. So we eventually moved away from growing produce and more into raising bees for honey production. Okay. And it's, it's kind of morphed from there into other branches of beekeeping. Oh wow. And Annie, how many hives do you have? Approximately. Well, empty hives a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, active hives. Active hives, probably 25, 30. Okay. And uh, Kent? Uh, well, in the in the middle of the summer, we will be up to around 600 hives, but we that always goes down to around 400 going into the winter. We have had as many as 1,200 hives Oof. when we were pollinating watermelons. Mm -hmm. and oh when we backed away from the pollination thing because it's just really hard to do everything oh, if, yeah. you're, if you're a one-man show. <laughs> and we backed away from that. We pared down our numbers. Yeah. So. And understand your wife is very active behind the scenes. She is. And she is. The backbone of the business. Pretty much. Sure. Yep. Well, you can say that. <laughs> well, I, I ahead, just, no, the one thing I think our viewers may not realize is that for any kind of crop that you raise, no matter what it is, you have to have pollination. Okay. And people don't think about that. And bees sure. are one of the best uh, pollinators that we have. Well, I was going back up and just for our viewers and to remind me, why are bees important uh, to our agriculture and, and to our environment? Well, the, the primary importance of honeybees is that they're the only insect pollinator that can be moved by the truckload into a field to pollinate a particular crop. And all crops don't require insect pollination. All right. Some crops are self-pollinated or wind pollinated, mm -hmm. but there are crops that absolutely have to have it, have insect pollination, because particular crops have a male bloom and a female bloom. Uh -huh. And uh, without an insect to manually move the pollen from one bloom to another, it will not produce fruit. Melons, cucurbits of all sorts, like pumpkins, squash, cucumbers, those sort of plants, vine plants, absolutely have to have an insect pollinator. 
and that's oh. that's where honeybees come in because they can be moved in mass into a field to pollinate. All right. So in other words, I move bees in to pollinate this field, and then I move them to some other place. It's, yeah. And they're the only mm -hmm. insect that. And that that is a, that's a practice. It, it's not unique to the United States, but when you get away from the United States, our agriculture system, you don't see nearly as much of it because the need's not there. We have huge fields of one crop, monoculture. Okay. And that means that you've, if you've got a huge field of watermelons, you've got to have you insect pollinators brought into it. If you have a half an acre of watermelons, probably not. Oh, I see. But uh, when you get up over a quarter to a half an acre of a particular crop that requires insect pollinators, then you have to bring them in. And other countries are not all that way. Oh, okay. Well, I, I think there's an example that, uh, of that that you find with uh, almond trees in California. Yes, yeah. uh, bees are taken, mm -hmm. migrated there to, and the apple orchards up in Washington. Right. Yep. Uh, are some examples. So. Yeah, some apples mm -hmm. require insect pollination, some apples mm -hmm. will self-pollinate, but all apples and all fruit that bees actually work the bloom, are the fruit is improved fruit. by the uh, extra pollination. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, further as you answer this question, what type of bees are there out there? The honey bee is the only one that produces the honey, right? Honey bees are the only bees that we have that produce honey in the form that we recognize Rise as, as honey. being honey. Okay. What other kind of bees are there? There's approximately 7,000 oh <laughs> different types of bees. Okay. And there's four types of honey bees. Okay, I didn't, okay. We only have one, one type in the United States. And there's, Asia is the only continent that has all four types of honey bees. Mm -hmm. There's a dwarf honey bee, there's two you might say mid-sized honeybees. One is called the Asian honeybee, and the other is the European honeybee. European honeybees are what we're familiar with okay. as honeybees. And then in Asia, there is also uh, a giant honeybee <laughs> as well. And all of those produce honey, all of them. Oh, those four types, okay. All of those four types produce honey, but only the Asian honeybee and European honeybee can be managed. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. That mm -hmm. that was what I was looking for because I kept reading about bees and I, you know just so many different types. Uh -huh. Well, Greg, I'm already getting educated <laughs> and we're, we're, this is just the introduction. Oh, I know <laughs> it. And, and uh, at this good time, I think for yes. us to take a short break and uh, listen to a happy tale about a neat little cat named Selby. So give a listen. This is a happy tale about Selby. In 2004, Judy Schwender moved to Paducah to work at the National Quilt Museum. Jessica Biasi began at the museum that year also, and she got a long-haired kitten named Selby. In 2010, Jessica went into the Peace Corps and needed to find a home for Selby. Judy was happy to take her, as she is a sweetie. Now Selby has a forever happy home. Hi, and welcome back. <laughs> Wasn't that a neat tale about oh, yeah. Selby? And uh, he, she's a real neat little cat. Well, Annie, if people want more information from you about bees, how can they get in touch with you? Well, they can come to the bee meetings that we have every first Monday night okay. in Mayfield at the Extension Office. We have a Lake Barkley Beekeepers Association, okay. and everyone's welcome at okay. 630. Hot luck. First night, you don't have to bring anything. Just come and listen. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you, you've. Well, what? How can they reach you if they have any questions for you personally? At Your phone number. Two seven zero five five four zero zero six eight. And I understand you have a presence on Facebook. Facebook, yes, and under Annie the, Royals. Granny, okay. And it, Bee Barn. Bee Barn is um, local uh, bee. Uh, sales okay, place gotcha, okay. that sells equipment. Okay, but they could, that's how they They can go on Facebook and find, find more information, information there also. Okay. okay. Okay, now in this section, you know, you read about, or you, I've read about, the vanishing bees. Okay, tell us what the problem is there. What, what, what is this phenomena called, the vanishing bees? Well, a uh, common acronym for it is CCD, and which then? stands for Colony Collapse Disorder. Okay. And the reason it's called that is because nobody knows. 
And they just know <laughs> that they go out, they had a healthy colony here one week, and two weeks later, there's no bees in it. Are there's the no, bees dead? The bees are just gone. And there's several different uh, symptoms that follow this. Okay. One is that uh, normally honeybees will not leave larvae in the hive. They're, they'll stay and take care of this larva. That's mm -hmm. their young? That's the young. Okay. A honeybee is an egg, then a larva, then a pupa, then an adult bee. Okay. And the larva, the honeybees just don't leave larva. They but, take care of. But in, with the CCD colonies, there's larva in the hive that's left. And the other thing is honeybees are notorious thieves. And if a hive becomes empty but has any kind of resources in it, like honey, right. the other bees in the neighborhood rob the okay. honey, steal if, the if honey it's empty, from it. If they can get yeah. in there. And sometimes okay. they will attack a weaker hive and That's steal right, the right. honey. Okay. But in, with CCD colonies, they won't, other bees will not rob the honey. And other insects won't, won't to go after the honey. Huh. So it's almost like nobody wants anything to do with with this colony that's gone, there's no dead bees in it either. Okay. All right, but before the bees disappear, are there any warning signals that your colony is going into this collapsing syndrome? We are, we're beginning to understand a little bit about the precursors. Okay. And one of the precursors is that the bees appear to be starving while there's food available. Okay. And even though they feed, they, they're, it's like their stomachs are full, but they can't digest it. They, okay. Their bodies can't access the nutrition from the food that they take in. And one of the, one of the characteristics of a starving hive is that they will begin to cannibalize the pupa and the larva. Oh, okay. And if they're starve, if they're truly starving. Uh -huh. and or think they're starving. Or think they're starving. Uh -huh they will cannibalize the larva and pupa. But if, they're, if their stomach is full, they will not cannibalize it, they'll just drag it from the hive and, and take it out of the hive. And in times of dearth, where there's no nectar, no pollen coming into the hive, uh -huh. a lot of times you'll see a healthy colony cutting their losses and dragging the larva and pupa out of the hive so that they won't have to feed this, use resources to, to feed, feed this larva anymore. Uh -huh. And so the pupa won't uh, uh, kind of graduate into adulthood. They won't develop. They won't develop and take more resources. And that's what you begin, that's one of the, one of the symptoms, a precursor okay. to CCD. And that's primarily due to exposure to particular pesticides, okay. uh, that, that digestive issue. But CCD is not a single faceted problem. Okay. It, it takes more than one stressor to actually trigger this collapse. Okay. And other stressors can include uh, viruses which are vectored into the hive by varroa mites. Varroa mites what, feed. What's that? What's a, var a varroa mite is a pest that was introduced from Asia into this country by accident. Okay. Because most of these problems go back to global economy. Okay. And there's very little way it, to control right, things right. moving mm -hmm. around the world. Right. Uh, but varroa mites came here okay. uh, from Asia. By accident. But by accident. Our bees did not have a pest host relationship. Asian bees survive with varroa mites. Okay. European bees have not been exposed to varroa mites and it just wiped them out. But uh, here again, we get into chemical issues, but it's our chemical issues. Right, there are right. chemicals we could use in the colony to uh -huh. kill the varroa mites. But in the process of the bees developing a pest host relationship where they will survive with a larger population of varroa mites in the hive, they also started showing symptoms of viral infections okay. that the varroa mites carried, a lot like Lyme disease or yeah, right. Rocky Mountain spotted fever that a tick will right. will infuse into us, mm -hmm. and that's that's how varroa mites vector these viruses into a colony of bees. Well, one or two viruses, and there, there's dozens. Okay. But one or two viruses coupled with pesticide Sides. exposure, coupled 
with uh, a dysentery a disease that shows up from time to time. It's just a natural thing. If you couple those together, then the colony collapses. Okay. In other words, their plate just gets really full of bad problems. A honeybee's immune system is very primitive, and they can handle one thing pretty well. Okay. Sometimes they can handle two things and not die. Okay. But you put three or more issues on the honeybee, and their immune system crashes. Okay. All right. And so at that point, they essentially, as you say, they leave the hive and they go off somewhere. They die somewhere, but you have no idea where they've gone. It's the, it's the older bees that mm -hmm. are most affected because they've been exposed to more things over their lifespan. A honeybee only lives about six weeks mm -hmm. in the summertime. They'll live longer than that, than that in the winter. Okay. But in the summer when they're actively foraging, they'll only live about six weeks. And the way that they die is that they fly away from the hive as an older bee. The older bees forage. Younger bees take care of the hive. Okay. And they fly away from the hive, and they don't have the strength to get back. Mm -hmm. then they pick up a load of whatever they're foraging for, and they don't have the strength to get back. A honeybee is cold-blooded. But in the social structure of a colony, the colony reacts like a warm-blooded mammal because the individual bees can regulate the temperature uh -huh. in a cluster of bees. Right, okay. That but uh, by their self, they're cold-blooded, and they can't regulate their, their body temperature. So the honeybee will only live about 48 hours or less. Oh, my goodness. Outside the social structure of, of the hive. Of yep. the hive. Mm -hmm. Goodness. So that's how they die. I mean, that's why there's no dead bees left in a colony collapse situation because as the older bees die, the younger bees have to forage. So okay. they become foragers at a younger age, and they wear themselves out. And okay. they've been exposed okay. to all this as well. And they, the bees die in the field, pretty much. They don't, okay. the colony collapse doesn't mean that the colony just up and all leaves. Okay. They're dying one at a time in the field but uh, in dying individually, but in great numbers in, gra in, in the great field. Numbers, right. That's why you don't see any dead bees in the colonies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have a colony that dies and there's a big pile of dead bees where you can see them, uh -huh. in, either in front of the hive or inside the hive, it wasn't colony collapse. Okay. If it's something else too much of sounds it. Like of course, a, it don't mm -hmm. make them any less dead. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like a very serious problem for our crops and a very serious problem for honey and just a very serious problem, period, yeah, in, the, it in, is. In, the, in the agricultural domain. So yeah. something to really be concerned about. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, I'm Oof. just learning more and more about this, and it's a fascinating oh, area. It is, it is. It's a lot more complicated than the, uh, I ever it, thought yes. it was. But, uh, uh, we'd like to take a, a second short break right now and uh, listen to a tale about a small cat who is a buddy of Selby's called <laughs> Little One. So give a listen. This is a happy tale about Little Kitty. In 2011, Deb Lyons and Merle Pashadag, residents of Lower Town, found a tiny American short-haired kitty who was maybe a month old. Deb knows Judy Schwinder through the Paducah Fiber Artist and knew she was thinking about getting another cat. So, Deb called Judy. Judy met the kitty who crawled all over Merle at the meeting and now Little Kitty lives with Judy and her sister cat Selby. Little Kitty gets into everything and harasses Selby something awful, but they both do tear around the house together a lot, making it a very happy home. Hope you enjoyed that tale about Little One and uh, he and uh, Selby just seem to get along wonderfully well as, as little cats. So. And uh, this afternoon we're talking with um, uh, Kent Miller to Darlene's right and to her right, Annie Broyles, who was with us on part one of, of uh, Buzz from the Hive. And Kent, at this point, uh, how could our viewers get more information about uh, bees and hives and how could they contact you? They can contact me directly uh, by email. Okay. It's KV, as in Victory, Williams at WK.net. And your phone number? Uh, my cell phone is 270-970-1307. And I don't mind talking about these. I, do, I would <laughs> never get it. And you, and you also are very active with the Lake Barkley Beekeepers. Yes, ma'am. Okay.
He's the president. Oh, you're the president. <laughs> oh, oh okay. that's another hat that you wear. Yeah. Okay. But, but about how many members do you have in the uh, in the like we have association? We have about uh, 55 members, but we vary in uh, we numbers of, uh, that in attend the meetings anywhere mm -hmm, from sure. 35 to 75. I mean, well, you don't have to be a member to come to a meeting. Okay. All right. We don't require well, that. What percentage of those members actually are beekeepers? Uh, I'd say nearly everybody. Nearly everybody. I mean, there might okay. be one or two people that are kind of teetering on the edge of, I think I might want to do this, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And they come to learn to find out yeah. if they think they can do it. But nearly everybody is a beekeeper. In Kentucky, how is how are we faring with the C C D or the colony mm -hmm. collapse disorder? Well, Kentucky don't have quite the issue with C C D as some other states because there's not that much commercial beekeeping in the state of Kentucky. So bees aren't moved in and out of the state. And by commercial you mean those people who truck the yeah. bees from place A to place B yeah. for cross pollinate. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, ma'am. So we don't have problems brought into Kentucky from other states. Other bee, the bees get yeah. contaminated yeah. or when, when get you, viruses. Uh, you mentioned almond pollination yeah. uh, a little bit ago. In California. And, in almond pollination, there's uh, about 1.8 million colonies of honeybees in California all at the same time. And they're all placed in fairly close proximity. So <laughs> if, if you have bees from Michigan, mixed with bees from Minnesota right. and Florida and Mississippi and Texas, all of those bees together, by the time they get sent back to where they originated, right. everybody has the same problems. Right. So okay. problems get spread Very a, lot, easily. a lot more easily uh, in and we don't that have situation. As much and we don't have that as in, much Kentucky. in Kentucky. Not nearly as much. There's one, one beekeeper that uh, occasionally ships bees to almonds, but he does have bees in uh, right. orange groves in Florida, and he moves all the way to Michigan for blueberry pollination and cherry pollination. Okay. So he's the only beekeeper that would even see this sort of thing. Okay. And so that helps us. With that help. It insulates us. It insulates us to right. some degree. But there is a problem with colony loss, and it's not necessarily CCD. But any of these issues that come together to cause CCD, right. uh, any of them have the ability to kill a hive right. or kill a colony on their own right. just by their self if something goes wrong, if, if uh, the queen becomes uh, unproductive for right. some reason or the hive decides that they need a new queen and make a new queen. Or they queen. don't get enough food. They, they don't get enough food. That, any of these problems can, or we have a, <laughs> an extraordinary I mean, winter, winter right. like we did this past <laughs> winter. Now, any of these problems can compound to kill a, colony, kill a colony, and losses were really severe this past winter, not just in Kentucky, but nationwide. Right. Okay. Which le leads us to an important question, you know, what can one individual do to help with the bee problem? Well, the number one thing is something that most people may not really be <laughs> that keen on doing. The number one thing is become a beekeeper. <laughs> okay. Because the more people that have colonies of bees, the more likely it is that right. if your bees die, maybe Annie's don't. Right. And you can always have somebody that you can go to uh -huh. to replace your bees. Right, you don't, for example, mm -hmm. you might have one hive or two. You don't have to have like 300. You don't have to have, no. you don't have, to right. have three or 500. You can have a couple, three hives, maybe five hives, and that's the number one thing. But after that, you can plant uh, honeybee friendly plants. Everything that has a bloom is not honeybee friendly. Right, what's, what's honeybee friendly? Anything in the mint family. Mint, okay. Anything in the holly family. Okay. Anything in the brassica family, mustards. What? Mustards. Mustard. Uh, Mustards, turnips, radishes, oh, oh, okay. gotcha. uh, big fields, big field plantings, canola, uh, plants like buckwheat, trees like uh, tulip poplar, really nice shade tree that produces a lot of nectar for honeybees. Okay. Loc black locust trees, 
not such an attractive tree unless you're a honeybee. <laughs> then they're really attractive. Mm -hmm. um, linden. Basswood, linden trees, they also are really good nectar producers. If you're looking for shade trees, if you're looking for hedge or, or winter, you know, uh -huh. winter hardy, evergreen plants, anything in the holly family, things like autumn olive, privet hedge, those Black sort eggs. of hedges. He's uh, a master gardener too, I see. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not a master gardener. But when, when you uh, study beekeeping, right. all of these other things come into play. It's, it's, you have, right, yeah. it's part of the, the bee it, problem. It's part and parcel of, of being a beekeeper is understanding what they need to eat. Right. It don't do honeybees any good to plant a big field of tomatoes. <laughs> they will not work tomatoes. Right. Mm -hmm. And also, the less pesticides you use and the more friendly things in, um, on your property that you can have for pest, it. Pesticides in powder or dust form, okay. such as uh, like, like a seven dust or carbaryl, in the dust form are a lot more dangerous to honeybees because they get the dust on them and they and can't it, get it off. They, well, they take it back to the hive. Take yeah. it back to the hive, right. A, a pesticide that kills the honeybee in the field is safer for the colony than right, a pesticide that kills, kills it, it. that kills it slow that it can spread to the you. colony. Um, more eco-friendly, I mean. More eco-friendly yeah, practices, right? Yeah, that, right. those are the, the less toxic chemicals that you can use that would get the yeah. job done. Yeah, I hate to interrupt you, but okay. <laughs> what one final point would you like our viewers to remember? <laughs> if you can say. One, one out of every three bites of food that you take is just because of honeybees. So we need to protect them. Just right. honeybees. There's a lot of other insect pollinators out there that are very good pollinators. Honeybees are the only thing that can be moved from field to field gotcha. to pollinate. Okay. Wow. One what third of our food in what America. A, what a lesson. I, I just don't know what I can say but to thank these two for, <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here with all of this knowledge. Yes. And, and we've just barely scratched we the just surface. Cra we're just scratching so the surface. I think we can promise our viewers some more uh, <laughs> shows on dealing with bees and the problems that uh, oh, yeah. we're encountering. So uh, anyway, it's, it's time for us to wrap it up I for today, I can't believe it. Darlene. It just I went so it. fast. I know it. That's, any, I'm Greg. and I'm Darlene. And we want to remind our viewers what we tell you every time. Give your pet a little extra love today and every day. And take care of the bees. Absolutely. See you next time. Bye.